that something else or what? What a movie. Wow. All right, so um, we have the pleasure of uh, having um, about 45 minutes here to, to chat with uh, some of the key people behind the film. Um, and just to recap who we have here, uh, to my immediate right, uh, Todd Miller, uh, as you already heard from David Fierro, he's the uh, uh, award-winning director of this film and other award-winning films. Uh, also the founder and co-founder of Statement Pictures, which is based in Brooklyn, New York, where he's down from tonight. Um, Thomas Peterson, to his immediate right there, is the uh, producer and uh, DP, which I had to ask what DP stands for. It's director of photography or cinematographer, to those of us who don't know movies very well. Uh, he's a co-owner of Statement Pictures and was also involved, of course, in uh, the Dinosaur 13, which is their previous award-winning film, as well as this award-winning film. Um, Tom was uh, born and raised in New Orleans before he moved to New York City in 2003, so it's a cool thing. And hometown hero here at the National Archives on the far end there is uh, Dan Rooney. He's chief of the motion, motion picture, sound, and video branch at the Archives, and he's the guy who led uh, the National Archives effort uh, into a digitization partnership, uh, which made the really amazing parts of this film, well, actually there are so many amazing parts of this film, but one of the really amazing parts of this film uh, possible, so um, thank you. I'm gonna take um, privilege of uh, being the moderator to ask a couple of questions myself first, and uh, we have some microphones set up on the side, when we, after we, we're done with the first couple of questions there, we'll start asking for audience questions, so if you have a question, get yourself to a microphone, please, and ask it at, at the microphone, and then we'll, we'll pass it around, okay? All right, let's start. So, Todd, um, this is the place where all the stuff gets stored. Well, actually, not here, right? The film's actually out in uh, College Park, right? Uh, but the National Archives is, is the place. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this project got started and how, we want, how you wound up in the partnership with, uh, with the National Archives to make this happen? Yeah, it was kind of your fault, Bill. Um. <laughs> I, okay, I wasn't fishing for a compliment. Yet, okay. But... Uh, uh, initially, we had reached out to, uh, to NASA, um, to, to Bill and, uh, and to uh, Bert Ulrich, um, PR director at uh, NASA, and we had made a short film uh, about Apollo 17 uh, that uh, some people have seen, um, and it, we really tried to play with uh, the, the narrative structure of just only using archival material. Uh, so it was really a primer, a blue, a blue uh, print for you know, what Apollo 11 would be. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, tail end of maybe 2016, somewhere in there, uh, and uh, you had recommended Dan. Uh, and I think my first initial uh, contact with Dan was probably via email, and then uh, we, we jumped on the phone and I said, you know, I want to uh, scan, uh, film scan, because we had some new technology. Uh, the company, the post-production facility uh, back in New York, um, who I've had the pleasure of working with a lot over my career, uh, was getting into the film scanning uh, business when a lot of companies were getting out of it. Um, so I told Dan, we want everything related to Apollo 11 in your archive. Um, and I think he probably thought I was nuts at first. <laughs> yeah. um, and that basically is what started it. We started with a nine-day timeline. Uh, and I was working with uh, an archive producer, Stephen Slater at the time, who's based in the UK, mm -hmm. um, who was introduced to me uh, by uh, a wonderful uh, colleague, uh, Ben Feist, who's here right now. Where's Ben? Ben? There he is. Um, and uh, uh, around the time that it was probably a few months into the project, uh, our contact with uh, Dan, he alerted us to this uh, discovery of this large format uh, material. And right around about the same time, uh, we were alerted to 11,000 hours of, uh, of mission control audio. Um, we really didn't know what in the hell to do with it. Because <laughs> it was all, it was mismatched. Uh, it was just a, <clears throat> it was kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. There would be, you know, a, a retro fire guy from day two for four hours. And then on day six, you might get the Capcom. Uh, and it wasn't synced up. It was very poor quality. And because of Ben, and really Ben alone and, and a couple other guys, uh, they developed some code and software to be able to sync all of that together, uh, do all the time remapping, uh, and then clean it all up. So by the time uh, we were able to deal with it, um, uh, and I'm sure we can talk about it a little bit later, but Tom uh, just was able to go through uh, the lion's share of it and find some uh, really good uh, stories. But that's really what, you know, what, how it all really began. And when Dan had alerted us to this large format collection, that was, uh, it was via email, uh, May 10th of uh, 2017. You remember the day, huh? Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Cool. Well, uh, Dan, okay. Large format film, 
here, it's been sitting there in the archives, people forgot about it. How does that happen? <laughs> well, I think <clears throat> when people ask me that question, the first thing I say is you have to understand the sheer volume of what NASA uh, created during the Apollo era. So we're talking about tens of thousands of reels of film. Um, and uh, the system actually uh, worked the way it was supposed to, uh, but these uh, particular holdings had suffered a little bit from uh, being underdescribed, um, didn't entirely know what was there. And there were also um, financial and institutional barriers to being, being able to work with uh, those kind of formats over the years. Um, it's an incredibly expensive uh, proposition. And um, so it, it suffered, you know, again, from not being, probably being pushed to the side over the years and not being um, on anyone's uh, priority radar. But uh, when I first started learning about the project and about the experiences of, um, of uh, Todd and Tom with uh, previous projects they had worked on, it really presented the opportunity to go, not only to go and sort of re-quantify and re-evaluate, um, provide some numbers uh, in terms of just what we have for the totality of Apollo 11 holdings, but um, to look specifically at those holdings. Um, and there were a few key moments in those early conversations that Todd alluded to that sort of had me thinking along those lines. And I think I had said to them, well, there is some, you know, you guys are interested in IMAX production, there is some 70 millimeter material, so let me do a little research, see what I can do and get back to you. And uh, thus the email several, several weeks later. Um, but that really actually was just the beginning of uh, months and months worth of research to really understand these holdings better and um, uh, figure out the logistics of how we could start building a partnership and work together to be able to discover and rediscover what, was, uh, what those holdings were part of. Yeah, one of the amazing things of, of the production was that uh, as the film was going up to New York to be scanned, um, Todd would bring some of it back here to Washington and, and we had it a couple of times. The first, the first one of those showings were, were, you know, some of us got brought in who were involved in, in the movie, got to see that. It was just eye-watering to see, you know, the high res stuff, it was just, uh, anyway. Um, and then you would tell us we were wrong on certain things, so we have to go back. <laughs> that's that's my it. job. I, I complained about things like that. Anyway, yeah, and, and um, um, you know, Dan, I, I sympathize with the problem. I mean, you know, we can't afford to have 70 millimeter projectors sitting around waiting on the off chance that somebody asks for things like that. So it's a, it, it's a real challenge with archival work to, to, to maintain the equipment and, and get things out there. Now, um, Tom, one of the things that I think people don't appreciate you know, or, or won't appreciate is that a lot of that footage there that you see where, where people are talking in mission control, those close-ups in mission control, right? Um, I saw that footage hundreds of times probably over the last 30 or 40 years, and it was all silent. So tell us a little bit about how, how, how suddenly that became well, sound quality stuff. Uh, yeah, that uh, stuff was shot MOS, which is without sound. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it basically every almost every single frame had to be synced up. Uh, and the sources of that audio came from, you know, much of it came from this 30 track. Um, there are also other sources, you know, air to ground audio, the loops, the, the onboard audio that they were recording. And, you know, a large amount of that was done by our archive producer, Stephen Slater, who's kind of made it his life mission to do that. He's basically been doing it his entire life. Um, He's nuts. He <laughs> is. Uh, he's, he's one of those British guys who, has a hobby. He, yeah, he's got a hobby. He, uh, he is. No social life. He's, like the rest of he's one of a kind. Yeah. Um, we love him. So, uh, you know, as as Todd mentioned, the you know, in terms of working with the thirty track, uh, you know, all credit to Ben Feist for basically, you know, it was it was sort of a jumble when we got it, and you know, it it, it got plopped down in front of me, and I'm like. I, I, <laughs> Uh, okay, where do I start with this 11,000 hours of basically, you know, completely uncatalogued, mixed up audio? And not only that, but uh, there were, you know, I mean, the, the quality of it, there were variations in pitch and, uh, you know, flutter and wow, it's called. Uh, and, you know, there were very short clips and they were all out of order. Um, so basically, once Ben worked his magic, uh, you know, we were all kind of able to divide it up and conquer and, uh, 
you know, work basically outward from key moments in the mission. Um, and, you know, it's everybody you see in mission control on a headset is talking and that got recorded. So figuring out who was talking, figuring out, you know, we you click on a channel and, uh, you know, somebody's talking about the booster and, you know, you know, so it's, it's sort of, the the you know we knew the key moments in the in the timeline so it was sort of just developing those stories out of that um, and it was really you know it, it was it was kind of starting from there and working outward and then sometimes I mean it was just it consumed you know most of our time for you know the, a, a good chunk of my life now it seems <laughs> like so far uh, but it was, you know, it was just sometimes it was, it was the luck of the draw. And I'd be like, you know, I'm looking at a waveform, so there's a, you know, I can see there's some activity. I wonder what's going on there. And, you know, sometimes it would just be this fantastic thing that would be happening. I mean, it would, you know, a, a lot of it was, you know, really exciting mission critical stuff, uh, you know, that, that we're hearing for the first time, like, um, you know, the, the 1201 and 1202 alarms going off and the people in the back room who are identifying them and all that stuff that's happening. But then a lot of times it was like non-mission critical stuff that was happening, like the reference to Chappaquiddick, which was like, oh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we're in this bubble, like thinking about nothing but this nine day timeline. And, you know, there's a reference to what's going on in the greater, you know, the, the greater culture at that time. Uh, so it was, you know, it was, it occasionally was monotonous, uh, but it was always, there's always something thrilling happening in there. Yeah. Can I say something that was cool Please. that they found? Yeah. Um, so everybody knew, you know, within, I think even, you know, NASA had been reported before, uh, even in the transcripts on the Apollo uh, flight journals about uh, this 24 year old uh, engineer sitting in the back room named Jack Garman. So when those alarms are going <clears> off during <throat> the landing, um, it was, it, it was, it came down to a 24 year old uh, flight controller sitting in the back room to give basically the abort or no abort command. So we all kind of knew that, that was kind of steeped in, you know, uh, Apollo yeah. 11 lore, but we never heard his actual voice. Um, and then Tom walks in one day, he's like, I got the voice, here it is, you know. <laughs> and then it was little things like that that he was able to find. Um, and like the Mother Country uh, song that's in there, that really got played, Buzz Aldrin really said, hey, you guys want to listen to some music. Tom walks into the office one day and just kind of says, hey, you might want to just go to this channel and this thing, there's this really cool song that's on there. And as it turns out, like that song in and of itself had its, had its own uh, history uh, where uh, John Stewart, uh, who was the folk artist, unfortunately had passed away, but his uh, wife, uh, was, uh, who's, whose name is Buffy Stewart, she's a, a folk artist in her own right, plays banjo still to this day, wears an eye patch. Um, and she, she's awesome, lives out in Sausalito, California. And it turns out that they had uh, a, a great cr connection to the space uh, 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 um, community. They knew uh, the uh, uh, John Glenn and his family. They knew uh, the Carpenters. And uh, they had been on tour with RFK. In fact, the night that RFK was assassinated, the ambassador, they were supposed to have ice cream with him in his hotel room. So um, it was this real convolute you know, kind of coalescence of uh, history that all kind of came together. And, and, I can't credit Tom enough. Like that just came from just basically a producer sitting there and just like being interested in it and like just listening to it. And so everybody else that was supposed to be working on the 30 track <laughs> stuff, just they all went away because Tom was like just amazing at it. Yeah, and, it, and as you can hear, it's hard because it was picked up on the on the on the voice. I've the got voice. pretty good ears. I listened to it a thousand times. I still can't like make it out. It's incredible that he was able to. There was a month long period where I, I'd come home and there'd be black stuff all over the sides of my head from my my headphones. <laughs> you know, sweating into. Uh, you times. guys, you guys did a great job with that. Okay, so uh, the film premiered in January at Sundance this year, right? Uh, wins an award. Commercial release in March. Um, it, you get the, the um, uh, award from, um, oh yeah. Um, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking Award, that's right, Communication Award. Um, so great critical reception. Um, what do people say to you, you know, you know, from an audience like this after, after showing it? You know, what, what's the sort of the reaction to, from normal people? It's been really amazing. And it, you know, the film's kind of slowly rolling out internationally. So we've been out there a lot. Um, but what's astounding to me is that uh, everybody has a connection to the story, and it's fascinating. People that either live through it, 
um, or they'll bring their kids. Uh, you know, a lot of us that worked on the film, we all have children, and they were kind of around in the edit suite, and they were, uh, you know, as amazed about it, you know, as we were. So um, I think that's been the biggest surprise to me is everybody how connected they were. And it certainly wasn't lost on us uh, making the film about just how uh, large in scale uh, and scope this uh, entire project was. It was really incredible. I think for me there was one, there was a woman who came up after a screening in Sundance and she had, her dad was a contractor who worked in launch control and she had seen him in the footage and she had no idea that this piece of footage existed. And, and he, had been, he had passed you know, years earlier so she was really, really emotional. And, you know, I mean, that was probably the most personal connection, but everybody's, everybody's got a story. So it, it's really amazing. Yeah, for me, I, I, was, I was 11 years old when this happened, right? It's 50 years ago. And uh, it was black and white TV. And I, I thought I was, I was in there. I mean, I'm watching this thing and I'm paying attention to it. Wow, what an what a amazing experience we can now have with the, the new technology, with all the materials we have from, from the archives. And, um, amazing job on that. And speaking of the archives, I'm going to toss it back to, to Dan back here. Um, what's, um, what do you see as the big challenge ahead? I mean, it, now we've got this footage that, uh, we've, thanks to the film, uh, it's remastered and we'll now have for posterity for all of us to use. Thank you. Um, and, uh, uh, but what are, the, what are the future challenges to making uh, this sort of material accessible to the public? Well, one of the great things um, that's been going on at the, here at the National Archives the last several years is um, the archival processing, cataloging, uh, preservation work of our team. And uh, it, it's really just started uh, in earnest in the last few years, uh, in particular with NASA holdings. So um, NASA was such a big operation, the holdings were spread across all the different NASA centers. Um, it's taken many years for them to sort of find their home here at the archives. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of the staff and the work that they've done on cataloging it, making it accessible, uh, providing you know, searchable databases, and now digitizing a lot of the material and getting it online as well. But there's still the challenge of, uh, as I said earlier, just sheer volume, um, duplication across collections, tracing back uh, the most original sources possible, which was a big part of this project too. Um, and the data challenges, um, and the, not just from digitized uh, archival film holdings, which is massive, and it's been massive for this project. So that's kind of our immediate uh, next challenge um, as far as this project is concerned. But if you think about uh, the future and what NASA is doing now, and the amount of uh, video that they can capture in enormously high resolutions with all the digital cameras today, uh, 4K, 8K handheld cameras on board with the astronauts, the deluge of data that that's going to generate in the future, that's the real challenge for, um, for the archival community going forward. Yeah, my colleagues at NASA aren't going to make your job any easier, I don't think. No, no. <laughs> okay, so um, Tom, start to finish, about two and a half years, something like that, right, for the production? What do you guys? Can yeah, you, it was about, yeah, the camera in 2016, so, yeah, uh, yeah it's going on uh, three years. So, um, across that span of time, you know, what do you guys, what, what, was, what to you was the biggest challenge of making this movie? I think it was kind of what Dan was just saying. I mean, I, I can't say enough, that's why it's <clears> so, it's amazing to be here at National Archives where, you know, this, they, um, and NASA, of course, too. Uh, but the data set was so large. I mean, at the end of the day, we were uh, approaching about two petabytes of, of data. Um, and to just manage all that uh, was just, it's enormous. And let's not forget, uh, we survived two government shutdowns last year. <laughs> and then uh, back in January, that got shut down for a month. And you might as well just, you know, set it back, uh, you know, a year. I mean, it, it, it was... Um, but it was a real testament to Dan and his team's dedication to put processes in place uh, while we were uh, not only doing the film scanning, but just everything else that needed to be done, because it was just, it was a round-the-clock operation, nerve-wracking as, you know, all get out for, you know, the better half of a, a year. Um, not, only, not only were we dealing with priceless holdings, we're also dealing with new technology uh, and the, all the pitfalls that come with that. So, um, but... 
uh, Dan was, you know, took a, 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 a leap of faith in a way and, and, uh, uh, and, and trusted us and the entire team and apparatus we had in place. Uh, and it just goes to show um, that we've created something that, you know, is going to survive. I'm just not talking about the film, but uh, we scanned just a ton of stuff. Uh, all the Apollo missions, uh, for the most part, um, all the large format stuff, uh, everything related to Apollo 11. So it'll be really interested to see what future filmmakers, you know, and, and future historians and researchers can do with this material. So good luck organizing all Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Small job. Tom, any, do you oh, yeah, no, I mean, it, you know, a, a, a lot of the reels that we scanned, we didn't know what was on them uh, before we scanned them. So <clears throat> uh, keeping track of not only not only what was out there, but what we had, what we were scanning, what was on it, the quality of it, where it fit into the greater picture, you know, the, the, the you know, where it, it actually physically was at any given time. Um, you know, that was, just that part of it was, was kind of overwhelming. Um, and that was, you know, this guy can make a, Spreadsheet like I've never seen before. Uh, <laughs> this project had the mother of all spreadsheets. Yeah. Um, what would we do without Excel? Right? <laughs> yeah. It was also tough too. We talked about it earlier, but uh, the, when we started working with the astronauts and their families pretty early on in the process, like Bill was saying, we would we got lucky and we got to go to the National Air and Space and test scenes and show them to the people that were there and get feedback and try to get it as accurate as possible. And in the beginning of the film. Uh, there was a flashback sequence with each astronaut that lasts about 20 seconds. And, um, you know, uh, Neil Armstrong's sons, Rick and Mark, had just amazing to work with on the project. And, you know, we were getting things, uh, personal photographs and uh, home movies from all, yeah, all of them, you know, Michael Collins, his family, and Bosno. And it was really tough to stay focused just on the creative and only use that 20 seconds. You know, I think you could make a feature film out of all that, you know, stuff that they gave us. Uh, but we all just, you know, stuck to our guns in the original plan of uh, creating. But that was hard to, you know, yes. not include that. Stuff. So much to work with. And I think, too, the, you know, the, the level of technical accuracy uh, that we were trying to live up to. Um, and I think, you know, what, what Todd was doing in terms of creating something that was a, a story that was driving forward, but at the same time, like, I remember a, like, a week-long period, which you were very much involved in, you know, one of many like this where it was, you know, it was like, the, does a transfer van make a beeping sound when it <laughs> I was wondering up? if you're going to bring that up. You know, that was a good, and it was, you know, it was back and forth, and, you know, we're looking at the, you know, the, when, did, when did vehicles start making that sound, and then, um, uh, you know, the, the passive thermal control maneuver where they're, where they're rotating and, and what orientation of the spacecraft and all this stuff, and so this is, you know, and, and like, Todd and I are separated by a, a half wall in our office, and so I've got the headphones on, and then he comes over, and he's like, Dude, I got it, I got it. You know, they're, they're, they're rotating like this during passive thermal control. You oh, know, that was very exciting. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> this is, oh, yeah. This, okay, I got to say this, because this is the genius of Bill Berry at NASA. So um, the, actually, the, those two things were great. Uh, this is like a typical email back you'll get from Bill. And sometimes they take like very, they're like a couple days, he'll know it right away, or it's like a deep dive research type project that'll last months. Uh, I think with the Astro van, that was that took a while. It did, yeah. yeah. Um, but you found out that it was like a Japanese made like thing, and then you they, tracked down the drivers. And <laughs> they, they started beeping the next model year. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just so you know, for the reference. But what was really interesting uh, was to learn we were uh, we were in the office and we had you know we plaster that looks like an insane asylum of uh, you know pictures. It's like and, a pol police procedural yeah. murder mystery. Um, in there. But we had every photograph, so it was 1,025 photographs spread across the seven magazines of Hasselblad imagery. Things weren't lining up. Uh, how could they take these photographs out that, you know, the number two, number four window? At this time, it just didn't add up with what we perceived to be the traditional passive thermal control maneuver, which is NASA's fancy way of saying the barbecue maneuver. It's like if the capsule was on the way to the moon, it was shot like a gun. Yeah, and, uh, and they thought it was right, shot like it. this, you know, and it was rotating like this. So, uh, and we had audio evidence that kind of contradicted that. And so we contacted Bill, and uh, he, you went all the way back to the MIT Flight Dynamics Group and yeah. got some original documentation that said the command module stack was actually 
rotated celestial north for the translunar journey and spun like a top like this. And for the trans-Earth journey, it was uh, rotated this way and spun like a top. And then it all made sense. Um, but that is, <laughs> you know, took a little bit. Like, like it does, yeah, yeah. typically. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that's one of the fun things about being chief historian at NASA. Most of the time, I spend my time in meetings worrying about the budget and other things like that. Every once in a while, I have an excuse to go do a deep dive. So thanks for, thanks for throwing some really weird questions my way. You're welcome. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, we, had, we had a great time. Um, before we go to the audience questions, one, one more round here. All this week, as NASA's chief historian, I've been getting called and interviewed and things like that. And they always ask me, well, what do you think the, chief, the main legacy of the Apollo program was? So I want to ask you guys. So we'll start, start down with Dan. What, what do you think is the big legacy of the Apollo program? I think one of the things that I've enjoyed seeing come out of this whole project is um, providing this contribution to the historical record through imagery that's here at the National Archives. So there's, there's all these details. And you know I've been to a number of these screenings where a lot of these details come out and just additional facts. And like you guys are talking about doing these deep dives you start to realize all the things that the Apollo program touched and all the legacy that, that it has nowadays. And um, that's really been fascinating to see that all just simply through the imagery and the sounds. So that's been kind of my reaction to the whole thing. Tom? Um, I, I don't know, I, I think maybe I would say, a, in my experience, a, uh, you know, a new understanding of the spirit of of cooperation that allowed it to happen. Um, you know, it was really a, just a, a, you know, a worldwide effort between so many agencies and companies and individuals. Um, and, you know, I mean, it was, you know, it was inspiring for that to sink in at various times over the course of, of making the film, um, which, you know, for me, it made it much more real to, to actually, you know, hold a canister of film it was shot then, you know, and no, I, you know, I'm, I'm the next person that's holding it after this person, however long ago, you know, had a much, much more, made it much more immediate, so. Okay, Todd. Yeah, I think Legacy was, of Apollo. Um, yeah, I think uh, the legacy of Apollo is just the, the, like Tom alluded to, it's the, it's a cooperation. It's, it's absolutely amazing that in such a short amount of time, so much was accomplished by so many. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, you know, I, I think that, you know, how lucky all of us are. Like, you see those images of the guys getting suited up to go on this mission, representing all of us, to go do the, something like that and know that there was hundreds of thousands of people all involved that got them in that room and then got them in that van and then got them into that, you know, that ship and kept them safe that entire time. Um, it's just, it's thrilling, and I think, you know, if we're lucky enough as a human species to be here thousands of years from now or millions, however long it lasts, um, you know, uh, I think people are going to look back on this time. I mean, we're one, two generations removed from the invention of the airplane, and then we just went to another world for the first time. It's truly a, an amazing step in evolution uh, for all of us, and, um, and Apollo, you know, did that. that. That project was the one that captured the entire collective conscious of the entire planet and, and drove us forward. Um, and uh, I hope we you know, get out there and do it again sometime. We're hoping to do that, that's true. <laughs> All right, now it's time for question time. I see we've got some people lined up, so I'm gonna start over on this side, sir, if you please. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, th two quick questions, if that's all right. Um, first is, uh, does similar large format film of the other missions of that era, including maybe Mercury or Gemini, uh, also exist? Yes, okay. uh, there's, there's actually uh, quite a bit. So we, uh, throughout the course of researching this, um, there, Na NASA had actually been shooting uh, that type of large format footage all the way back to the Project Mercury era. They relied on it fairly heavily for um, high resolution image analysis, particularly um, uh, shots on the launch pad um, to study you know, if something went wrong on the launch pad. Uh, they were able to get very high resolution imagery out of that. Um, the first 20 or 30 minutes of this film, that, that was a, actually a different format of film. Um, and NASA and the, uh, their Technicolor contractors at Kennedy Space Center had been experimenting with that. Um, the, the Todd, it's called the Todd AO process. It was popularized in Hollywood in the 1950s. 
uh, back to you know 1967 um, in, in Kennedy Space Center. They had actually uh, done some experimental photography, created a widescreen documentary of their own. Uh, for one of the first efforts of that was a film called Bridge to Space. Um, and that started uh, really uh, around the time of the Apollo 8 mission. So the, the whole collection that was scanned for this project kind of covers the Apollo 8 through uh, Apollo 13. Great. Um, I think my second question is probably for Tom. Uh, in that scene where Charlie Duke is asking why they've gotten to the moon four minutes early, um, <laughs> and then they say it sp really? speaks well for the booster, I think it was Charlie Duke. Was, was someone censored there? Did their, the end of their last comment get cut off when it says nope? <laughs> that the, you, you're stirring up a real controversy. <laughs> a real controversy within the filmmaking team. Uh, now, uh, Are internationally. You a plant? <laughs> yeah. That's really Steven Slater. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Steven Slater yeah. in disguise. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, if you're living in Texas, I think you might know what the answer was. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go to this side. Yes, oh, congratulations to the whole team. It was just a masterpiece. Isn't this it? is my second time seeing it on a big screen. And uh, I had two quick questions, also one for the director and one for Dan. A uh, question for the director is the music, incredible background. How, could you speak to that a little bit about how you chose the music? Because it sounded incredible in this theater. Yeah, like everyone, like Tom and myself, we've all worked together forever. Uh, mm. My music composer, uh, Matt Morton, um, I've known him since we were kids. Uh, and he came to us very early on with a different approach. He said, look, I want to pre-score the entire film uh, with only period instruments. So he only wanted to use instruments that were around in 1969. And the backbone for that was this 1968 reissued Moog synthesizer. Um, and you heard it, um, you know, and he didn't know how to play it. I mean, Matt's like a composer. And, uh, and but he, um, uh, did the deep dive on it. Took him about a year to learn how to, you know, play it. As he, if he was here, he'd tell you. Uh, they only reissued Moog. Uh, they reissued it, uh, uh, 25 of them. He got like 13, and like Keith Richards got 14. He's all proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you very much. A quick one for Dan. Um, Dan, have you had a lot of people, other filmmakers, approaching you since um, since Apollo 11 came out to ask you to? Uh, furnish them with um, support, archives, other movies? Has it, has it um, yes. increased the access? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're coming to me, that. too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Over on this side, yes, ma'am. Hi. The, I was just amazed at how vibrant the colors were. I, too, was watching on black and white television. And yeah, any rate, so did you have to do anything to enhance the colors, or did the original film really have? capture such vibrant colors? Oh yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of, it, was, it wasn't more, uh, you know, we treated it with kid gloves, but there was an entire restoration effort uh, that took years uh, to do on the film. Um, and it wasn't, the large format stuff, uh, you know, it all had its hurdles just because it's very unwieldy, um, just large format in and of itself. Uh, I think Dan might have mentioned Moonwalk One, which was the production that was shooting uh, a lot of that footage ended up in our film. Uh, but they actually switched from large format uh, uh, shortly after the launch scenes because it was just too expensive. It was just too, uh, too much, too time consuming to deal with. Um, so uh, our you know, hats off to our post-production house. Uh, I mean, it was like, it was literally looked like mission control around the clock and shifts 24-7. Uh, um, and that's one of the reasons why we had to work on the film uh, in New York. Uh, originally, we were going to come here and bring the entire team here, uh, but we were limited uh, in, in hours, basically. So, um, but the 16 and the 35 millimeter, all the stuff that people have seen before, we just wanted to up the quality of all that. Uh, and there was kind of a diminishing return on the resolution involved. So we thought if we could, our tests kind of showed at 4K maybe was kind of the you know, that diminishing return line. So we scanned all of that stuff, and that stuff needed a lot of attention because it had been uh, either transferred over the years, you know, a lot. Um, it had been stepped on a lot of times. So uh, going back to the original source, again, hats off to Dan and the team, going, getting all the, every time we wanted to deal with the original negative that was processed. Um, and that's, you know, it, it, anytime you digitize things, you introduce foreign things, simple things like, hairs, dust fibers, so all that stuff has to be cleaned up. Um, so there's just a ton of 
stuff. I mean, every single frame in this film was poured over by hand. Um, and uh, we had a team in London and a team in New York around the clock uh, dealing with all of that. Wow. Thank yeah. you. I think I, I, can I add something to that, though? I will say, though, that the first, uh, from the very first test scans we did, we were surprised at the quality. It Unbelievable. Was, I mean, yeah. so it, it's really both of those things, I think. It was um, the film, uh, in terms of you know, face and emulsion scratching, was extremely minimal. Um, and so, yes, color restoration and yes, frame by frame restoration, and a lot of effort went into that. Um, but it was, it was kind of remarkable seeing the first images come off the scanner when we were doing the testing, just how clean it was. And um, Todd was, you know, as Todd mentioned, you didn't always have that with the 16 and the 35 millimeter just because, um, probably for the most simple reason that it had been used and handled so much more than these reels had over the years. So it was really, I think it was really both of those things. Yeah. yeah. Great. Over to the left. Uh, hello. Uh, so I was, uh, I was seven during Apollo 11, so it definitely was a big part of my childhood. And the legacy I see of it is that it permanently made our dreams bigger. And occasionally we've lost sight of that, but it's never completely gone away. The thing I wanted to ask, is there anything that you know, when you started, you thought you would want to include that you weren't able to find either the film or the audio, or was it more driven by the things you were able to find? Um, well, first off, I like your t-shirt. That's really cool. Yeah, it's <laughs> some nice shirts out here. Yeah. And you were seven. I was negative seven. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was more um, when you start to you know, read Mike Collins' book, uh, you know, the first one, it's just carrying the fire in 74, and he talks about some scenes that, you know, or you, you hear an interview that Neil Armstrong gave 10, 15 years ago. Um, you realize that there's certain scenes where you talk to him, you know, and, and you, you realize there's certain scenes that had not, not Neil, I don't talk to Neil Armstrong, of course, but, you know, the family members and the astronauts. Um, there's certain things that haven't been depicted in a fiction and nonfiction film. Uh, so, we were constantly trying to find things in the archive that reinforce stories we had heard or scenes that needed to be depicted. Uh, a good example of that is the translunar injection maneuver. Um, unfortunately, on Apollo 11, they didn't shoot that much footage. That wasn't their mission. They were just supposed to get there, land, get home safely. Uh, so unlike all the other, particularly the later uh, Apollo missions where they just they filmed a lot and they shot a lot, uh, and obviously on the later J missions, they were on the lunar surface a lot longer. Uh, you didn't have that with Apollo 11. So, uh, but fortunately for us, on other Apollo missions, they did shoot it. So we could use uh, the translunar injection scene, uh, for instance. Uh, all the Apollo astronauts described seeing a sunrise that was happening uh, because uh, the engine had fired uh, to go to the moon on the dark side of the Earth. And in the film, you hear Neil Armstrong describe that as uh, we're crossing the Terminator right now, meaning the imaginary line on the Earth from the from the dark into the light. And uh, we were able to uh, find that uh, uh, on another Apollo mission. Again, through testing, like show it to Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins who were there. Is this what it looked like? And get some feedback and try to design it to it was as accurate as what they remembered. Good. Sir. Uh, hi, just say thank you so much. I know people usually say congratulations, but thank you to the archive as well. It's just. Um, Extraordinary. I saw this two weeks ago in the IMAX in London, um, and um, I dragged along five or six of my friends and, and my brother. And then we spent the next two hours just standing like dummies on the South Bank in London, drinking beer, staring at the sky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which my brother did point out, to be fair, isn't that different from what we usually usually do. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really was something else. But um, I, I, it really moved me, and I was thinking about why and and. Uh, I've been thinking about this. Usually we go to the cinema now and we watch things and you have to remind yourself it's not real. And I found myself watching this and having to remind myself this, this, this is real. And that's how, how beautiful it was and I think that's a testament to you. But it got me thinking about what are the responsibilities and opportunities for the archives and filmmakers about truth and what's real in this in this kind of um, kind of age, yeah. so um, if that's t too heavy a question to answer, um, the other thing I was interested in knowing is um, what was the hardest bit of footage to, to leave out. But I'd be really interested in knowing what you think about that um, that sort of 
truth and what's real. You want to take a stab at it? Sure, yeah. Thanks for your uh, comments and the question. Um, just out of curiosity, you see it at the Cine World or the Odeon? In the uh, IMAX, yeah, that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that's the Cine World. Yeah, that's an amazing screen. Um, we, uh, um, we were very fortunate to develop a relationship with Al Reinert um, to, towards the end of his life. Uh, Al made a fantastic documentary called For All Mankind. Uh, it was up for an Oscar back in the 80s. And, uh, he, he was a screenwriter on Apollo 13, uh, and um, uh, constantly talked to him about how polarizing uh, his For All Mankind was. There's, there's mm -hmm. some uh, within the space community, people either love it or hate it. Um, I'm in the camp of love. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we dedicate the film to him. He's one of the filmmakers we dedicate the film to at the end. Um, and he, we would always talk about, um, uh, you know, the responsibility you have, you know, as, as filmmakers. People ask all the time, did you watch any other films? Were you influenced by them? Yes, of course. Like, you know, 2001 is up here and all of us are down here. And, uh, but we're all just links in this, you know, long chain of, of history, particularly with space films. You know, it's a genre in and of itself, whether you're doing a documentary or a fiction film. And I think it's incumbent of all filmmakers uh, to uh, recognize that responsibility. And, um, and it's the reason why we put you know, our blood, sweat, and tears into this film, uh, to tell it in the best way uh, that we could and to be as um, uh, truthful as we could as well uh, and try to involve as many people you know, in, in the orbit as we could. And we got very lucky and we had just amazing support with Dan and with, with Bill. Um, which was terrifying too, because you know it's like these are you know we knew we had some big critics you know involved, but um, I, I think uh, the unique thing about our project is we're in a unique position to uh, be a, a little bit of a, uh, a bigger link in that we can uh, uh, position all the materials that we were lucky enough to have access to um, and prep them for, you know, future filmmakers and whoever's going to come down the line. And I'm really excited to see what other people can do with some of these materials. Uh, so we don't have to look at little postage size stamp, you know, size of images of astronauts getting suited up. That was, to me, that was one of the most amazing things about this whole project is not only did they make a beautiful film, but, but you know, the, the whole production team working with, you know, Dan and the NICE archives, I mean, the legacy of this you know, digitization project is will, will echo down the years. It's just amazing. Uh, one other comment on on the film thing, the the truth thing. That to me, that was one of the greatest parts about this my collaboration anyway, with with the, the, you know Todd and the team, and, and um, is that I wasn't worried about whether they were going to take some liberty with things because they were they were determined to tell the truth and they, they you know and they wanted to know what direction did the barbecue roll turn and, and did the truck beep when it backed up all those kinds of crazy questions like that um, when when we deal with Hollywood you know Hollywood producers will sometimes come to NASA and say can we get your help on things and uh, we'll submit lots of comments and many of those they go well yeah you know that's really nice but um, it looks better this way so we're going to do it this way <laughs> uh, and I didn't have to worry about that with these guys so that was that was wonderful. Um, I think we have time for another one, maybe. Anybody over here? Uh, I work at the uh, National Archives, so I'm absolutely thrilled at the uh, opportunities that this creates for archives, not just in, in for these records, but just you know, getting out the word about the great things that our agency does. Um, I have a rather trivial question, though. I was curious about um, the the kind of the line line art animation that was used throughout the uh, mm -hmm. film to uh, kind of illustrate the different stages of the mission. Um, is that something that you all came up in uh, yourselves and created yourselves, or was that based on any, any original na uh, NASA material that they had done to animate these various things? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. If you go back uh, to, if you look at all like, even down to the flight plans on Apollo 11 or any of the Apollo missions, that's what they look like. They're very, simplistic, minimalistic, just you're, you're only given the information you need. And that's what we you know, tried to do with this, um, to try to make it feel as simple as possible, um, that you know, it's something my mother could understand, but also uh, you know, some physicists could understand as well. Um, and we spent a, lot, a, lot, uh, you know, a, a, a long time on that. And it's also uh, a homage to the early Apollo, uh, or the early NASA uh, industrial films that were made. And, 
particularly the late yeah. 50s, early 60s, um, uh, that were getting into you know, Gemini and, and the Apollo missions. Uh, they used a lot of that, um, and it ended up being used in uh, Moonwalk One as well. Uh, Theo Kamika, the director on that film, uh, decided to use the older cell animation, uh, and it, uh, I was always very um, influenced by that. That's a quick one. Maybe we have time for one more? Come on down. You're the next contestant. First, I just want to echo uh, the sentiments of our British friend. Um, I was sitting in West Virginia at a friend's house a few weeks ago, and he said, hey, you want to see this film, uh, uh, Apollo 11? I'm like, um, yeah, well, I just saw First Man, so, it, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. And uh, he has a 4K TV, and I don't. So I watched it on a 4K TV, and I was literally floored. I said to him, who are these 1960s, late 1960s folks? In, uh, this is a movie, isn't it? I mean, is this real, or is this a movie? I was literally that astounded. So thank you so much for what you've done. My question is sort of an odd question, but it goes towards the space race. And uh, in your uh, listening to the archives and such, did you find that, did NASA update the astronauts on the Luna 15 mission? And was there dialogue about that going on? And um, can you comment on that at all? Yeah, yeah, there was quite a bit of it. It was, it was really interesting, you know, and there was even uh, a couple of jokes were made about it, um, but it was, uh, you know, within mission control, there were, you know, there was qu quite a bit of discussion about it, so yeah. Thank you. And there was actually a diplomatic effort that happened as well. Frank Borman, who had visited uh, Russia um, just earlier that month for 4th of July, uh, wound up calling uh, the head of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, uh, who actually did turn out to be an important figure in, this, in the space program, even though the Academy of Sciences didn't really run the Russian space program. Um, and they actually exchanged data on, on the orbit so that they'd make sure they wouldn't interfere with each other. It's actually a very interesting episode in, in competition, but still engineer to engineer, you know, agreeing not to, not to mess each other up. Speaking of um, speaking of the the thirty track audio, I forgot to mention, but uh, Ben Feist's website Apollo in Real Time dot org. You, you too you. can have the experience of listening to all of it. Um, <laughs> so. Grab yeah. your astronaut ice yeah. cream and your alarm clock. And yeah, and it's going on now. And in, right now, yeah, you can right listen now. live. You can listen to what where we are in the mission at yeah. this moment. Not that we don't recommend you go out and buy yourself a copy of Apollo 11. Oh, actually, I'm a, good, I'm a civil servant. I can't recommend that you do that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, not that but you ben might not want to watch it. Ben works at NASA, so yeah. you yeah. can endorse it. But, um, but all that audio, those, those all 30 tracks also that wasn't in the movie, it's happening right now live on Ben's website, ApolloInRealTime.org. Um, and you can watch the whole thing, or you can play it back, or you can listen to whatever you want. Uh, it's a stunning, it's a stunning site, and you got to check it out. I'll buy you guys all beer later. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be it's waiting a cheap for it. Ploy, eh? ben. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and while I'm busy um, uh, making recommendations and thanking people, I'd, I'd like to particularly call out the National Archives Foundation. Thanks for setting up this arrangement, and our friends at Boeing Corporation. I love Boeing Corporation. I used to fly a Boeing jet when I was in the Air Force. Um, so thanks for your support for these kind of programs. It's great for us to come and talk to you about these things, but it's also a great chance for you to, to see all these new things. So uh, any closing uh, thoughts, anybody? No, I just, it, it's been an amazing experience, and this has been a really great uh, time. And we thank everybody, and particularly Dan. Uh, you know, it's, uh, um, it's it, the, the work that the National Archives and NASA does is, is so unsung, and uh, I hope in some small measure that our film highlights the work that um, that gets done here in these walls uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I mean, the same, the, the question about what is the legacy of the Apollo program, I think, you know, if we were to say, what is the legacy of Apollo 11, the film? Uh, for me, you know, I mean, it was, it was very much a, an understanding of the, the, you know, the function and mandate of archives and, uh, you know, and, and the way that this partnership works and, you know, these, these flashes of like, you know, not only are we, you know, it, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're knee deep in this historical mission, you know, but we're also in some small way contributing to, you know, the, the record itself. So, it, you know, taking part of that was just, you know, it was very inspiring. So it's, it's amazing to watch it here. It's, it's been, you know, it's been great. Okay, Dan, we're in your house. You get the last word. <laughs> I, I think it's just, it's, it's been exciting to see what these partnerships can do for, for National Archives. Um, 
partnership, digitization partnerships are not uh, necessarily new to the archives, but in the film world, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of challenges. There's a lot of different kinds of um, considerations and uh, potential risks involved. And um, this was um, evidence when you get really smart people together and the spirit of cooperation I think that we all had. It was a true partnership in a lot of ways. Um, and so I'm grateful for that and I'm looking forward to um, seeing what future partnerships can achieve for the film holdings here as well. So thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good night.